up of the Meridian and the Rotary Club of Abuja Ministers Hills. It's a joint meeting, and I want to welcome you all to the meeting. And we are glad you have made time to join us. Please kindly mute your mics so that uh, you don't interrupt the meeting. And if you want to speak during the question time, kindly raise your hands and then you'll be given the opportunity. So I want to welcome you all once again to tonight's meeting. So shall we begin tonight's meeting by singing the Rotary prayer song? We ask to live as we profess. Thank you. In spiral terrains, Lord, we ask to. In spiral terrains, Lord, we ask to live as we profess. To dignify the daily touch and serving selflessness. For fellowship with your we offer to We pray that may occur to spread the So I will I'll ask President John to take over as he also welcomes us and take, continues with the four-way test. Hello, Rotarians, my, my partnering president, fellow Rotarians, Rotary leaders present. I want to welcome all of you to this meeting. It joins a joint fellowship between the Rotary Club of Abuja Ministers Hill and the Rotary Club of Abuja, sorry, and the Rotary Club of um, Tema Meridian. It is going to be an insightful and educative uh, fellowship. And I pray that we all pay attention and uh, try to be and get much, as much information as we would want to. Thank you very much. So taking the, the four way test, we would, I would ask, my IPP judge, my immediate past president, George Hemba, to please give us the four week test because I see he just kept, um, he just got admitted into the fellowship. So please, my IPP judge, the the four week test. Good evening, sir. Good evening, fellow Rotarians. Good evening, my president. IPP judge, can you, are you still online? Yes, I am. Please, can you give us the four-way test, the rendition of the four-way test? George, can you kindly give us the four-way test? Okay, Alpi, I think, can you go ahead? I think he's having a problem with sound. Rosham VJ, please, can you give us the four way test? I thank God, let them be talking. It's just me and you that know that for just be quiet. You understand? I will just pretend. Rosham VJ, please, can you give us the four way test? Uh, yeah. Good evening, President John, uh, President Philip. And uh, my fellow Rota President Nagu Emin and my fellow Rotarians, uh, the four-way test of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendship? Thank you. The four-way test, my president. Thank you, President Paz, President Vijay. So... Shall we all drink a toast to the Republic of Ghana and the Republic of Nigeria? To the Republic of Ghana and Nigeria. So 
I will ask President John to continue with the object of poetry. Thank you very much, Mr. VJ. Over, uh, over to you, my President, Philip, uh, President Philip. You can take over. All right. So, can a member of your club take us through the object of poetry? Okay. Um, I'm, I would like, uh, um, I think George is the only person online for now. So I would like my, my president from the Rotary Club of Abuja, Jabi Lakeside, Rotaryan, Gweme, you are, to please take the object of Rotary. Good evening, President Philip. Good evening, um, Trailblazer President John. PPVJ, members of um, RC Med uh, Tema Meridian and Rotary Club of Ministers here. My name is Guhem and you are the Trailblazer President of our, uh, Rotary Club of Abuja Jabilik site. The object of Rotary. The object of Rotary is to encourage and foster the ideal of service as a basis of worthy enterprise and in particular to encourage and foster first the development of acquaintance as an opportunity to service. Second, high ethical standards in business and professions, the recognition of the worthiness of all useful occupations and the dignifying of each Rotarian's occupation as an opportunity to serve society. Third, the application of the ideal of service in each Rotarian's personal, business and community life. Fourth, the advancement of international understanding goodwill and peace through a world fellowship of business and professional persons united in the ideal of service. My president, the object of Rotary. Thank you. Thank you very much, my, my trailblazer president, Ubuwemi Yuwa. I'm very grateful for that rendition of the object of Rotary. And we hope that um, in, our, in our moving on in life, in our career life, in our professional life, and in our everyday life, the objects of Rotary and the four waiters will continue to be guiding principles for us as better to as better human beings, as better Rotarians in the world. Thank you very much. Over to you, my President Philip. Thank you. So before we proceed, I would like to take apologies from our various clubs. So I received an apology from our past president, Elvina. She can't make it tonight. So that is the only apology coming from Tema Meridian. Okay, for Abuja ministers here, I have no apologies for now. And I'm still hoping that my club members will um, show up because we had a meeting earlier today and uh, it has been announced. So I'm hoping that they will show up as well. But I know that I have my treasurer online you know, as well. So for now, no apologies. Thank you very much, my president. Over to you. All right, thank you. So we'll take some announcement and the announcement coming from our end is our di district assembly, which comes off from the 8th to the 15th of April next month. So fellow Rotarians, members, please. It's going to be a virtual um, assembly this time. So we can keep the dates and make it a point to be part of this very all important event. And members are also reminded those who are here to honor their dues kindly do so by contacting the treasurer. So that is the announcement coming from our end tonight. Okay, for, our, for us as well, our district convention, DISCON is coming up from the 16th to 22nd of May, 2021. And it's going to be physical and virtual as well. And then it's holding at Quara State alone. The registration is on already for early beds. And then I'm hoping that everybody within District 9125 and anybody interested can um, as well key in for the registration and join us online as we um, celebrate the, as we draw close to the end of the Rotary Year open opportunities. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, President John. So please. I would like you to go ahead by introducing the speaker for tonight. Sir John. Oh. Does she have a, do we have a citation? Yes, um, 
kindly check your your message. I forwarded to you. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Once again, good evening, fellow Rotarians. Our speaker for today is our speaker for today is Dr. Bright Kumosdi. He's a natural resource management and strategic project management professional with over 15 years on international experience developing and implementing projects in Africa, Europe. And North America. Dr. Kumodzi leads community field engagement on USAID Integrated Land Resources Governance, I, IRLG, project in Ghana, which focuses on integrating land tenure security, livelihood security, and landscape carbon sequestration towards enhancing cocoa productivity in Ghana. He was the Natural Resources Management Manager for the US for the 25 million USD agriculture and natural resource management project. Looking at, looking at the development of climate smart agriculture within community managed natural resources landscape in, in Northern Ghana. Dr. Kumotsi is part of a national consortium developing the Ghana REDD project, project feasibility project exploring the potential for REDD nested projects in Ghana, with the potential to deliver up to 1.5 million VROS per year as well, leading the development of Ghana's country program, CPD, for, for assessing green climate funds under the UNFCCC. Dr. Kumozi was postdoctoral re researcher at the University of Laval, Quebec, Canada and obtained his PhD at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, Sweden. He was Chevney Scholar in Biodiversity at UNEP WCMC, Cambridge, UK, and a certified project management professional. And he's going to be and, and he's going to be taking us on the topic flood, food, and environmental security issues in Africa. My fellow Rotarians, let us welcome, warmly welcome our guest speaker for today, Dr. Bright Komotsi. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, John. Uh, thank you for the kind words. And, uh, and uh, I, I should say that I'm humbled. Thank you, Baptista. Thank you, Philip, for bringing me in. And uh, fellow Rotarians from, I'm not a member, but um, from all walks of Africa and from India. Um, I'm privileged um, to be amongst you and to inform knowledge. Work has been very difficult today. I tried to find out how work went and uh, it's been difficult, but I think that this evening will be a more relaxing one with all the profiles. It's just about just discussing issues in Africa. And so, um, Philip, if it's okay, I can, and, and President uh, John Motion, if it's okay, I can just go ahead, just make a snap discussion, simulate um, what are uh, talking this evening, and then just a few slides and get us talking and seeing how um, we can, we can giving us perspective into issues and seeing how we can resolve um, situations in our dear Africa. So thank you very much. Uh, and, and I'm grateful for your time this evening. So if it's okay, can I go ahead? Yes, please, you have, the floor is all okay. yours, sir. Okay, I can, I've shared my screen. Can you, um, can you see it? Not, not yet, sir. Just, um, we still see your wonderful face. Okay, so, so, um,
Is it okay? Can you see me? Can can you see the screen? Yes, now? we can see the screen now. Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, so I, I think that um, very briefly, like you read, um, I'm a natural resources consultant and uh, I work with Viridis Environmental Consult and the managing consultant. We look at how we can integrate agriculture development within natural resource uh, landscape. And, uh, and, and, and today we just want to just see how we can contribute to flood food and environmental security issues in Africa. So when we talk about flood, this evening, we just want to, when we talk about flood, it means that there should be river systems, isn't it? So can anybody tell me some of the rivers they know in Africa? I know we have colleagues from Indian, in uh, Uganda, can, can, what the Nile. are some of them? The Nile. Yes. What are some of the rivers in Africa? The Nile. Oh, the Nile, the Nile, the Nile, the Nile. Excellent. The Nile. Anybody else? We have River Niger in Nigeria. River Niger. Excellent. River Niger. Anybody from Ghana, can you tell us? Philip, you are the president. Can you tell us of any yeah, of the the white, the white Volta. The white Volta, so the big Volta. OK, excellent. Excellent. Anybody else? River Congo. River Congo, River Congo. River Congo. Then I think there's a Limpopo. Limpopo, Limpopo, Limpopo. 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 That's uh, from South Africa, right? Okay. Yes. So, so these are very big rivers that we do. And the slide that I've shown now are the major rivers in Ghana. All what we want to do is that within the, within Rotary Club, what we want to do is to help. And a lot of the things, mostly we see flood. We see people are displaced and then we have to contribute resources for the goodwill of them. And that's the only reason why we think that we should discuss this. A lot of the times people are displaced by flood. People are also displaced and their farms are destroyed. And then we see very harsh environmental uh, issues. And that is why we need to do that. So, so quickly, I'm just going to give you some short scenario of issues, and then we see how we can fix this into our programs, fix this into our projects, and inform that we, we get to understand and uh, what is happening, and then it informs our thinking of it. So we have looked at Niger, the River Niger. We have looked at uh, River Volta. Then we have the River the Congo, in the Congo Basin. Then we have Zimbabwe. Then Lake Tanganyika in East Africa. The Ugandans, are you there? Yes, we are here. Okay, so um, you, you can identify. So when we look at Africa, from Senegal to Niger, we see the Senegal river systems. We see Bota river systems. We see the Niger River systems, we see the Lake Chad, we see the Nile, we see East Africa, we see the Tanganyaki, then we see the Congo River system, then right down to South Africa, we see Zimbezi, then Okavango in Botswana, then Orange, and then Limpopo in South Africa, Limpopo in South Africa. So, so these are the river systems. But the sweet thing about river systems is that they provide the plain for us to grow food. And that brings us to the issue of food security. Because every day we need to grow food. And so these river beds provides us the food. Let's just narrow to West Africa. 
Just hold on a second. Hey, tell me. Guys, you are shouting. Be quiet. Okay. Okay, sorry. So in the in the West African system, we have the voter system. We have Mali, Burkina Faso, and this river system goes down. I want to illustrate what the consequences of growing food around the river and how, how we change the riverbed and then how this affects us in terms of so food security. How does it lead to shortage of food and the consequences as well as the other properties we, we, we lose in the system. And then this will provide some avenue for us to talk and possibly provide some possible solutions to the problem. So this is the voter system. So we are going to focus on the voter system. That runs through from Mali, the map that we have. From Mali, runs down through Burkina Faso, goes through Nigeria, but mainly through Ghana. So in Ghana, it goes right down through the north of Ghana. It runs from Mali, north of Ghana, and then comes down, down. And that contributes, the voter contributes about 25% um, to, the, to, to Ghana's productivity. So in terms of our hydroelectric dams, the, the white voter contributes about 25% of the water to our hydroelectric dam. But what have we seen recently? I wanted to show a video, but on the screen, we see that recently, I think since um, 1982, we recorded our first flood in, on the white, on the, on the voter, white voter in 1982. Since 1982 to now, we've had about seven incidents of flooding. And what it means is that the river exceeds, goes beyond its, its plains. And then in this picture, we see that it breaks the road. So in Ghana, for instance, two major towns, Tamale and Bolgatanga, and then Bolgatanga and Boko. This river was so, so flooded that it cut the link. And Tamale and, and Bolgatanga is the major link. It links Ghana and Burkina Faso. And then the road between Bolgatanga and Boko are the links between Ghana and Togo. So you have these roads cut from for international travel. What else do we see? During this season where the flood occurs, we have wildlife and livestock from Mali coming down the, savanna, the, the Sahel to Greece. So we have a huge stock of livestock coming from Mali, going to Niger, Burkina Faso, northern Ghana down to the south of Ghana. And when you have this flood, it means that the wildlife and the livestock cannot move down south. What happens is that they get, they get, they, they drown in, in, in the overflows of the river. So, so a lot of these people or uh, full animals who bring the uh, uh, livestock down south to graze end up losing all their livestock. All the farmers who think that farming along the riverbed is a lucrative thing invest every, all their money in farming along the river bed. The river gets flooded and they lose their investment.
And so all the question we want to ask is that when this happens, what drives it? What are the consequences? What are the important parameters that can inform, especially our duty as Rotarians, our duty as giving to people? What moves us? How can this move us? How do we get an understanding? And for me, this evening, I want to us to, to understand that these situations are common in East, West, North Africa, as an ecosystem person that these are common things and they can inform our, our, our actions. They can, they can help us to inform, we can be more informed in giving to these causes. So quickly, I want to say that when, what, what, the picture that I've shown on the screen now, is about people talking about um, what are not coming through. Then we build our houses. We also see that where do we get the sand from? When there is flooding, then it displaces the sand. And this is the sand that Tipa truck drivers go to fetch and bring to us. So we just order that, oh, I want two trips of sand. I want four trips of sand. But where do they get this sand from? We get it from the river systems. And when there is flooding, it means we have sand. And this is what does that. But on the other side, if we can order for sand, this sand goes into the turbines that pumps water. And when it goes into it, it means that you need a lot of uh, water purifying alum and everything in order to make sure that um, the water becomes clean. So quickly, I want to show you a graph about when sand comes into the water and then the different years that it, we happen that this time climate is changing, water is becoming very turbid. And so we see that it's increasing. Once this is increasing, a lot of sand is coming into the water. A lot of, we are changing it. The question is chicken and egg, who came first? Do we destroy the system or the system destroys us? And that's the most important to us as Rotarian. When flood happens, is it humans that are causing it or is by nature? And when that happens, we also see that uh, electricity prices increase and systems get destroyed. So I'm coming to tell you a story about how these river systems get flooded and what is causing it. It's just five slides. And at the end of the day, I want to make sure that we can say things, we can understand what causes the flooding and, and also how we can help. This is just one of the first slides that I want to do. So look at it very carefully. Can you see it? John, can you see it? Yes, we can see yes, it. Yes, we can. Yes, I can, sir. OK, OK, all right, excellent. So this is, when we say land use, land cover, it's basically, this is the whole Vota River Basin. So we can have the Nile Basin, the Congo Basin. But we are just taking one river system, very predominant in West Africa. And this is the river. So when we take this whole, the picture on the left, on, on the left was taken by the satellite in 2003. And it shows how the Volta River Basin, that's, that provides water for the whole people from, from Niger, from Mali, from Burkina Faso to Ghana, and part of Cote d'Ivoire and part of Togo. This is the, the major river, the Volta River that provides water. It tells us the state of the system in 2003. And then in the, on the right tells us the state of the system in 2017. What is causing it? When you look at it, we just look at the pictures. 
basically the green one shows that there are trees and it's the open savanna. The blue one tells us the water, about the water. That's the river. That's the major river. That's the river that's flowing. And we can always say wherever you are, attribute it to yourself. It can be the Congo River, it can be Nile River, it can be any of the major river systems. This is a snapshot of what is happening in Africa. When you look at the blue, which is the major water body, then you look at the green. That tells us about the forest around it. And then we look at the red, that's built areas where people are. But then we look at the gray areas and that's farmland. So let's focus on the forests. Let's look at the green, let's look at the red, and let's look at the gray, which is the farm, farm areas. So what is causing the river to get flooded? And why is it bringing problem to people? Let, let's look at it, 2003, 2017. Philip, what can you see in terms of the gray? In terms of the gray? Yes, the, the, the farmland. What can you tell us between 2003 and 2017? The color is changing, actually. It's changing. Excellent. Excellent. Mrs. Bob Miller, what can you tell us? Like, what can you see? Between 2013 and 2017, what can you see? The color is changing. Philip says the color is changing. What can you tell us? You realize with the first picture, the grayness is more, it, it's, I mean, it's, it looks more lighter in the second picture than the first picture. Okay. Okay. That's good. My sister from Uganda, what can you also see? Actually, when you look at the comparison between 20. 20, uh, 23 and 2017, there is an increase in uh, farmland and grassland compared uh, to 2003. Excellent, excellent. I, I think that you've given the good synopsis. So, so the big point is that what is causing the, is it the chicken that laid the egg or the egg that brought the, the, the chicken? What is causing the flood, flooding? from the presentation. I think, I think human activities is increasing over time. Over time. David, do you have anything to say about it? Yes, when well, I was saying that when you look at the two pictures, you see that the bare land is also increasing, uh, farmland and grassland is also increased as against um, open um, savanna, and you could realize that it's as a result of human activities because those ones are not natural things. It's as a result of what we do. Like um, the bare ground, we sometimes clear the land for agricultural use. And when you look at building, the red is increasing. We are building houses. We are increasing our farm population is increasing, and so more houses are being built. So that's what I, I, I see when you look at the two pictures. Mm, mm. I think Connie should give us some overview and then we'll move on to the next one. Connie, what do you think? Thank you so much. Uh, I think I want to also agree that um, the activities by man, especially the agricultural activities seem to be uh, part of the cause. And every time agriculture expands, we cut trees, uh, because that's where the fertile lands are and 
And when we cut trees, then we affect the environment. Okay, excellent. So let's let's go on and let's let's just try to narrow on this thing about humans influencing the system and the system influencing human activity. The next slide we see is we want to look at some land use changes within the middle belt of the white voter. And I always use the white voter because it's a classic system. And that illustrates what happens in all the river systems in, in, in Africa. So being the Nile, being the Congo, being the Zambezi, being all the systems that we think about. Let's look at quickly the sector within Ghana. Let's look at 1989. Can we see on the right hand side, the green bit is the 1989. We have two pictures the, to the right. Can we all see it? Yes. Okay. And then the yellow is the image in 2015. And then um, the image after the, the two images tells us the changes that has happened. So the green is basically, it was a forest. And you know that if you have any water system, you need forest to protect the water. However, if you expose the water, if you go and cut all the trees around the water body and you plant, then you expose the water evaporation goes up. It means that you lose a lot of water. And so let's look at this system in Ghana in 1989 and 2015. And just look at, at, at the two systems, the changes that has occurred. I think what I want, the message I want to say is that we need to understand how our activities are changing the water body and what that system brings to us. Felix, what can you say about the water system in 1989 and 2015? Hi, Felix. Doreen, can you help us, Doreen? Can you help us? The rain is not red. Mofon, can you help us? Anita can help us. Antoinette, help us to understand what is, can you tell us what is happening? How about Isabella? Please repeat the question. Can you tell us between 1989 and 2015, what is happening? What can you say about what is happening? And how does it inform us about flooding food security? OK, I can't see clearly, but um, from the look of things, it looks like the red, I think, is the bare surface, and it looks like the bare surface seems to have uh, it seems to have increased, and the agricultural. Sorry, it's really small. The agricultural land mm -hmm. seems to have been affected by some of the the red that I'm seeing. I don't know okay. whether I'm, I've seen or got I think any that, that's a good observation. Sheda, what do you think? Sheda, Smaran. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, Sheda, what do you think? Galaxy A20, what do you think? 
Daniel, what do you think? Hello, Bright. Yes. Yes. Uh, what basically I'm seeing here, uh, mm -hmm. in line with what my sister has just said, the gradual land basically increasing. I can also see the the waterbed is uh, uh, somehow reducing. So I think this is basically like a sign of maybe like a lot of like more drought. Then I'm seeing the riparian vegetation. Syria is also shrinking uh, between 1989 and 2015. So I see us heading more into drought. That's what I can see here. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Good observation. I think let's take the last one from Mr. Notu. Daniel, what do you think? What do you see? I think Betty would like to come in and say something. Say that again. Betty would like to say something. She has raised her hand. Okay, okay, Betty, Betty, go ahead. Betty, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, from the two pictures, me, I can really observe that you, there is massive destruction of the entire ecosystem mm -hmm. and the catchment is really affected. And we are seeing that um, the vegetation cover has almost disappeared like in 2015 compared in 1989. Yeah. And um, we are bound to have issues of water scarcity because the entire catchment almost is lost to anthropogenic activities. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Betty, Betty has summarized. Daniel, do you have anything to say? Daniela, do you have anything to say? Okay, so basically what we see here is that the color is moving from what Betty has said. We have yellow and then in, in, in 1989 we had green. By 19, uh, 2025 we have yellow. So it basically means that we have lost all the forests into crops. And what is happening is that we plow the forest banks, we remove all the big trees because they are no good for crops. And what happens is that the soil becomes loose and then it runs into the river channel. And so when the, water, the volume of the water comes in and it's high, it, it, it goes out of the river system, you know, and, and that's when we have the flood. And so the crops that you have, you lose it. This just tells us the changes that has happened in the system. So for instance, if we quantify it mathematically, we see that the water body, which used to be In 1989, it used to be seven point, um, the, the water body used to be 7.6% of the landscape. It has now in 2020, 2015 is now 3.5%. Let's look at the last column and the last row. Agriculture, which used to be what, 9.2% of the landscape is now what, 58.84% of the landscape. The forest has really decreased from 9.25 to 16.5. So all the, the message we want to say is that we are cutting all the forests and turning them into, into agriculture lands. Let's look at erosion, what is happening. Just basically look at the deep red color. When you see the red color, it means that there is serious potential of erosion. Look at the red color. 
and this is the web from Burkina Faso to Ghana. Look at it and see the erosion potential. And once there is erosion, take it from me, the, into the, the river channel, there will be a lot of what flooding and it will destroy all the croplands that you have. So look at the red situation and look at the very deep red situation. So we see around Bolgatanga, around the Gambanga escarpment, Boko, even right, not talking about Nigeria, but going up goes to East Africa. And this tells us how intense the erosion is. If you talk about erosion, how does that tell you about um, your, your water supply? You are worried that there is erosion and everybody is talking about erosion. But when you open your water, I want people to tell me from the different regions what qualifies to be good water within. When you open your tap at home, what do you say is good water? Anybody from East Africa? Maybe if, uh, Baptista from Ghana, tell us what do you think is good water? When you open your tap, what do you think is good water, Baptista? When the water is colorless. It's colorless. Okay, so it has not got any color. East Africa, what do you think is a good water? When it has no odor. No odor. Okay, very good. India, India, India. What do you say is water? When you say it's waterless, it's, it's, it's a good water. India, what do you think is good water? India, we have sweet, India, we have sweet water. That's what we call good water because we have two types we get. We get salty as well as sweet water. And uh, sweet Can water you that? normally. When the water is what? When it is sweet. We have salty as well as sweet water. Oh, from the okay, lake. okay. Sweet water. So, so yeah, it's from less... the yeah. So from the rivers, like... and, rivers and lakes, we get sweet water. Oh, okay, okay. That's interesting to know that you have sweet water. Ivory Coast, Daniela, when do you say it's good water? From Ivory Coast, Daniela. I answered, I said, I said colorless. When the water oh. is colorless. Okay, okay, okay. Baptista. Niger, John. I said when it's colorless. John, thank you, Baptista. John. When do you say water is good in Nigeria? Okay, um, is it's not heavy in the mouth because when you just some just some 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 you drink and then you know it's, it has this sipid taste. So you know we like to think that when the water is light and without germs, you know, algae and uh, bacteria, the ones we can actually see because there are sometimes water stays in um, in a container for too long, it develops algae and then um, is unsafe. So when the water is without germs and is light. Okay, okay. I think the last message I want to say from it is that when you look at when the water is, uh, Baptista said colorless. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. This is why. Sorry, we couldn't get you. When, when the water does not have heavy metals like lead and uh, cyanide, chemicals like cyanide and the like. Okay, okay, okay. that's good. Water. That's good. That's good, Chief Lampe. Yes, I think that's good. Um, it's difficult to tell about the lead and, the, uh, and, and heavy metals in it, but I think that's good. Then it means it's good water. But for our visual eyes, and again, it informs the projects that we do, that let's give this community water because we go into the community and then we see that this, the water they drink is brown. The colorness of the water or how brown the water is what we call in science, turbidity. Okay, so if we look on the graph on the left, 
it tells us about how brown the water is. And then we look at the years that uh, the brownness of the water was measured. What do we see? We see that from 2005 to 2020, the brownness of the water is increasing. Why is the brownness of the water? And so what the journalist shows on TV is that we see that these people are drinking in 2005, they were drinking clean water, but in 2019, they are drinking brown water. And what tells us that, then we tell ourselves, how did the water become brown? But did we see 19... 89 and 1925 and 2015. Do we see how the water changed? So because we are farming along the bank, because we are getting food there, it means that the quality of the water, we're losing the soil and the soil goes into the river system. And that tells us the quality of water we drink. And so basically the graph is just saying that as it's increasing. So as uh, we farm along the bank to get food, to say we are poor, we can't buy irrigation systems to go, then we pollute the water more. We get heavy metals. We make it brown. We do everything. And that makes sure that the cost of production of water increases. And that is the point that I want to make with this graph. So let's look at this graph. We, I, I'm sorry I'm telling you graphs, but I wanted to, to give you a mental idea of what happens. Down it is from January to December, how the water quality changes. Okay. I'm interested in the green one, in the green, just forget about the other colors and let's focus on the green color. In Nordic Ghana, we see that January, there are no rains. So it means that the water that goes through the channel is what we drink. The quality is very good, it's low. So it's, it's pure, the river runs quiet and we drink quiet water. However, because we farm along it, the river, by April, where the rains come, they go and wash all the loose soil, all the chemicals, everything that comes in. They wash it. And then we see by April, whilst the river is running, a lot of water is coming, we see the water becomes brown. And so from less than 200 NTUs, we go, we go straight to 800. It means the water goes from white to brown. And this happens in May, when the first rain comes. Then we come down then once the rain comes at the end of June, then we come down. But in July, where we have the peak of the rains, the water becomes too brown. And so all the water we drink is brown because of the flood, because of the farming along the, the water lake. Then it's, it's sustained because the volumes of water is high. However, by October, so from July to October, we drink dirty water. If the water company wants to purify this water from algae and everything, it means that they need to put in a lot of alum. It means they need to put in a lot of chemicals so that the water can be cleaner. But it puts cost, it puts cost on their equipment. The water becomes dense and it means that it will need more energy to pump it. So water bills should go up. People should drink dirty water because of our activities. What is the hope? By October, the grasses begin to grow and they stabilize it. By then you can farm along these river systems. And then by October, that we get into the dry season again, we have no rains and that runs till December. And then by January, it continues. So the cycle continues again. And so this explains the activity that we do contributes to the quality of water that we drink and to the poverty levels in communities that we operate. That is 
the message I want to send with this. I think the government is doing a lot of things to try to put down and make sure that we have, we have green infrastructure and those are the investments that we need to do. So we can contribute. How do we provide clean, clean water to, to, to the communities that we need? We need to let them plant trees to stabilize it. We need to help them with um, very good systems that can help them do good irrigation so that they can farm far away from the river. We need to give them alternative livelihood. So in terms of design of Rotarian programs, this is the big issue. How do we prevent people from farming close to the river? How do we prepare, prevent people from making sure that they can uh, put uh, systems that increase productivity without polluting the water? How do we make sure that pesticides do not get into the water that we drink at home? I'm telling you on authority that water companies do not treat the dangerous chemicals in water. They do not. We only make sure that it's, it's not brown. So if you have pesticide in the water, the organophosphates that are used in farming, they come straight into the water that we drink. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not here to frighten you. I'm just telling you to be informed as Rotarians. I think that you need to be informed and let your activities inform what you do. I think I've exceeded my 30 minutes. I think the conversation is sweet, but I'll end it here and invite questions. Philip, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, my amazing speaker and, lecture, and lecturer for today. It has been, it's a call to reality. It's a wake up call to reality actually, because seeing the, 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 the graphs that have been plotted shows that you know we are almost at the verge of um, desertification. So thank you very much, sir. So we'll be entertaining questions. If you have any contributions, questions and answers, please you should um, indicate by raising up your hand. Thank you very much. Rosira Catherine, you are up. Uh, my president, thank you very much. And uh, fellow Rotarians, uh, thank you very much for this very uh, insightful presentation. Uh, it is really, really amazing to see nature at work. And thank you for simplifying the presentation for those of us who are not uh, natural resource management specialists or environmental specialists. For me, what touched me most was the connectivity of the ecosystem and how it is all connected. And uh, I, my question is, um, what is going to be the scenario 20 years from now, given that very um, eyebrow raising uh, situation that uh, you presented? Where are we likely to be 10, 20 years from now? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, my guest speaker, would you like to um, take all the questions first or you want to answer them as they come? Yes, yeah, so maybe to get a lot, maybe let's take two or three, answer them. And then, so okay, let's I, take two I saw, I saw Mr. David, I think Mr. David or Daniel. Okay, another person, Russian Catherine again, is that you? Okay, no one raised their hands. For now, Hello. nobody's yeah, hands. Uh, yeah, I, I raised my hand. I raised my hands earlier on. Okay, Mr. Daniel. Okay, yeah, so okay. I, I okay, yeah, please, great please presentation. Go yeah, great presentation from um, Dr. Bright. I, I wanted to find out, looking at the way things have happened over the years concerning areas that are affected by this kind of drought and, drought and all those things, I see one thing. People are not changing. Why are people not changing? Even though a lot of investment is going into changing behavior in those particular areas. Why are people still doing the things that will cause this kind of things to be happening and not restrain themselves from that? Is it because of food or 
L or what? Okay, thank you. Yeah, you can go on, sir. Nobody else for now. Okay. Samsung Galaxy, are you saying something? No, I think your microphone is off. So can you? Okay, Mr. Mr. Uh, Rotarian Peter from um, uh, ROC Sunday, please go on to your question. So thanks really for the insightful presentation indeed. I guess my curiosity is about the potential other unforeseen challenges that await us because you know the the more we play or the more we fail to care for the natural environment maybe i i imagine there are many other challenges that are bound to dis to disorganize the way humanity lives with these environments and i just wanted to pick um the mind of the presenter in terms of what does he think in terms of the other things that we need to be, you know, worried and concerned about moving forward. Thank you very much, Roger and Peter. Uh, I think, Roger and Catherine, your hands are up again. Yes, President, just a very short one. Uh, something just crossed my mind. Could um, rapid population growth uh, be a, a factor in this very um, accelerated uh, degeneration of the environment. And if uh, uh, interventions to do with control of uh, population growth in Africa were effective, then we might see a difference. I don't know what the, um, uh, the speaker has to say about that. Thank you, President. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Roger and Catherine. One more question and then uh, that will be all for the question and answer segment. If there's anybody who is willing to ask any any, any other question, please indicate. I, I saw Daniel from the United States was trying to say something. Daniel, do you have something to say? I think he I think he, he, he already asked his question. Um, I have I have a, a, a question from um another Rutia Catherine. What are the waste management methods you are using in West Africa to reduce on the suffocation of lakes and rivers with previous with various type of waste that is plastic okay all right thank you very much I think I'll take the first question um, okay sir it's it's um, the next 20 years from now uh, this is the first question what are we doing now? What is the situation? What's the scenario? I think that it doesn't look good from climate change uh, models projections. What it means is that situations are going to be erratic, especially in uh, the Sahel. Um, rainfall is not going to be predictable. So in terms of quantity of water that is going to come through the system, means that people a lot what it means to us as ordinary people and rotarian is that we are going to have we wouldn't have water flow through our taps because all the vegetations have been cleared the channels have been widened it means that evaporation is going to increase a lot of the water is going to be lost and so we wouldn't have what enough water to go through there water company system. So what is going to happen, like they said recently in South Africa, is that they are going to import water. They will have to import water. And I tell you, the bills we cannot bear. So if we don't let our activities inform the practices that we do, I'm afraid that we might have to import water from one system to the other. And the reality is that we are Importing water from Congo to Ghana. Look at the engineering cost. Look at the energy cost. And it. I'm not sounding. I'm not being an alarmist, but that's the reality. If we continue, if the trend continues. So that's what is in. 
It means climate change is going to happen. Why are people not changing? Yes, there was a question of why are people not changing? In natural resource management, there is one empirical term. It means that the cost is borne by the locals, but the benefits are enjoyed by the widespread. And, and, and I think that that runs to the hearts of the Rotarians belief that we need to help people because if people need to protect our water system, they must eat and protect the water system so that it comes to Accra or it comes to Kampala or it comes to Abuja or it comes to Lagos. What would the people eat? They need to farm. And so if we say that, we can't say that don't farm. They must farm and eat. But as people who live, Rotarians who live in Abuja, as Rotarians who live in Kampala, as Rotarians who live in, in the United States, as Rotarians who live in Abidjan, can we pay for, can we invest in improved irrigation systems? Can we improve in effective water transfer systems so that people don't farm close to the river channel and inundate it with sand? This is one thing that we can do. And this could be the basis of our investment. Let's not just go and drill water. Let's look at the productivity systems. Let's, let's invest in drip irrigators. Let's invest in, in this. And that is what can let people, that is what can inform or that is what will make Rotarian's impact be felt. So why are people not changing? People will not change because they need to eat. But we can help change them by investing in systems such as drip irrigators that can help them not to farm close to the river system. Potential challenges with climate change, it means livestock, those of us who like kebab, beef, uh, eat beef and a lot of materials, sons and daughters of lion. It means that livestock will not have enough resources to survive. So that's, an, apart from crops, we the vegetarians, we might not get our vegetables. It means that our livestock in the dry season would also not have it. So it means that all of us, the West African cash crop will be suffering from it. So those are potential things. Population growth, I'm, I'm a scientist. I'm a natural resource scientist. I, but I do investigate population dynamics. It's a bit difficult for me. Maybe people who have population dynamics can see, but I think that in the rural setting, it's difficult to talk about population growth. In the rural urban areas, we can look at population control methods uh, using the birth control methods. But in the rural areas, coincidentally, it's, they have strong beliefs about population control because it, they believe in workforce. So if you live in the rural areas, the more kids that you have, the more they can support you in, 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 in productivity. So in agriculture, on your farm, the more pride that you have about having 10 kids. It's not like in the urban areas that you say, oh, I have only two kids because I want to make sure that they are well educated. You don't do that in the rural areas. So birth control is something that can be introduced, but we need to make sure that as Rotarians, we can, we can introduce that, but we can also look at how we can optimize the labor uh, efforts at the rural areas. And I think that population uh, control people or health workers can then use that to build on it. Waste management, uh, I, I have been in Sweden and I've seen advanced methods of, um, I studied in Sweden for about five years and I've seen advanced methods of waste processing. I can't say in Africa, I think in Ethiopia is doing very well in terms of recycling and uh, combusting it. Uh, but I think in Ghana, at the rural level, I think urban waste is killing us in, in, in major cities in Africa. And 
uh, I'm not sure that we have enough good waste management practices in the rural areas to contribute to the debate. So the next 20 years, why people are not changing potential challenges, population growth, waste management. I hope I touched on it. Thank you very much, sir, um, Dr. Bright, for your answers. And I hope that uh, uh, our Rotarians who ask these questions are satisfied. I would like to take um, Rotarian, Rotarian Connie Magomo from um, Provincial Rotary Club of Sunday. I think she raised her hand earlier. So Ma, if you can please ask your question. Then I'll take the other one from the from the chat. There's, there's another one on the chat that is asking from a Betty, Rosian Betty Dawula. Do you think payment for ecosystem services can save our fragile ecosystems if instituted and operationalized? Thank you so much. Uh, I also posted it. I was just trying to find out uh, if um, research or your knowledge shows that the linkage between poverty and environmental de degradation and what we can do to try and address that challenge if it is related at all. Thank you. Um, Oula, Oula Lamti, please. You are our last um, questionnaire for today. Please, can you ask your question? Question Oula, please. Uh, the question I want to ask is that um, what is the, the role of law enforcement? You realize that we have good laws, I mean, environmental laws. But then what is the role of law enforcement? To keep okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Bright, those, I think, um, were, those will be, that will be the last okay. question for, for this um, okay. session. John, so there, 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 there. John, there's one more question on the chat from Connie. You can just ask that also, and then we can close it. Okay. Um, from Connie, that is um, how are poverty levels influ influencing environmental management? Okay, I think she had she had already called upon her and she had asked that question already. So, Dr. Bright, please, um, you have the floor. Okay. 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 So, I think one thing that we've been championing recently, and that's one of my pet, is the PES. Payment for ecosystem services. So I, I'm I'm one of the consultants for USAID, con, um, designing payment for ecosystem services for cocoa systems in Western Africa. But so this question really excites me, and I'm going to talk about 100 minutes on this. But just to say that this is, I was a consultant looking at how we can develop, make sure that using this payment for ecosystem services. It, basically what it means, PES, or what it means is that how can people be, re, how can people be, pay, be paid or pay for services they enjoy? Let me break it. If you are downstream, okay, if the river flows from a mountain and you live in the mountain community, and you can farm, you can say that I'm a poor person, I'll farm in the mountain community and pollute the river. But if you are downstream, how can you say that, please, my friend upstream, my friend on the mountain, don't farm close to the river. I will help you so that you cannot farm close to the river and make sure that I drink clean water down the river. That's basically payment for ecosystem services. How do you, want, do you reward people to make sure that they don't pollute or they don't destroy the environment? So one of the things as Rotarians that can be done is investing in systems that will ensure that you don't destroy the integrity of the water that comes upstairs. So it's, it's very good in simple languages that if you look at environmental pollution, 
uh, uh, there was a question on poverty and environmental change. I would say that I'm poor. I cannot buy a hose that, or I cannot buy a pump that will push the water from, uh, from the river to my farm. And therefore I will work close to the river and pollute the river. It means that all the chemicals that you use, the chemical washes into the river. But if you can invest in systems yeah. that take the water away from the river, you'll be reducing the poverty, you'll be rewarding them, and you'll be pushing them. You know, so there is a very strong correlation between poverty and the challenges that we have. Okay. So in law enforcement, in natural resources management, cardinal principle, you cannot compel people to do things on their land. You cannot compel people to do. So if I am the chief of the place and I have my land by the river, you cannot bring, in Ghana, for instance, we have the buffer, uh, the buffer, buffer, buffer zone policy. It means that in spite of the river, you cannot farm some kilometers or some 100 meters away from the river. But you cannot win sand in the river. You cannot do this within. But you realize that people are doing it. And in the rural areas, enforcing it is weak. So yes, it's on law that you can do that. But in reality, it's difficult to enforce it. You know, so, so as Rotarians, this is the big picture we need to do that we, need, we want to alleviate poverty, but it's a challenge enforcing the law in this community. Uh, I think these are two questions. I mean, I think three questions were related to poverty environment and then PES. Is that it? If I yes. haven't answered this question, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much, Dr. Bright. And um, it is it's really an eye opener, you know. I, I, as the lecture was going on, I was actually thinking of a project or two that I actually can do around, you know, this discussion we've had today because, you know, it, it is really a wake up call to action. And as people of action, we can't sit and, you know, allow our environment be depleted in such manner. So thank you very much, Dr. Bright. And the, the questions keep coming in. Um, mm. How best can we enforce the polluter pace principle? Okay, polluter pace, okay. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's interesting. Uh, if, if you follow the Ghanaian budget, it's we put a tax on pollution and you have to pay that. Oh, okay. It's a bit difficult in the rural settings in terms of river water quality. And uh, in the rural areas, they are not even paying tax. So if you have major rivers, I think in development of water fund, one success story of water funds have been Coca-Cola company in Kenya. What was Coca-Cola was downstream and then um, upstream was the farmers. So Coca-Cola saw that in terms of water purification, it was uh, 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 a lot, a lot of money that they, I think they were spending one, one million dollars purifying the water before they produced Coca-Cola. But then when they started investing in the farmers up, 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 upstream, it reduced within three years, they were paying like $300,000, you know? And that tells you the real impact so if you can invest and then reduce your debt from $1 million to 300,000, that's a strong, strong, strong thing that you can do, you know? So in terms of polluter pay, if there was an industry up that was causing a lot of pollution, then it's easy to task that industry. However, a lot of the pollutants upstreams, a lot of the pollutants upstreams are people who cannot pay even for the services they do. So unfortunately, it will be difficult to implement the polluter because these are a subsistence farmers. 
Thank you very much, sir. That's wrap, that wraps up our question and answer segment. Over to you, my president, Philip, for the vote of thanks and the appreciation. So, John. Uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. All right, thank you, President John. Dr. Bright, on behalf of the Rotary Club of Tema Meridian and um, the Rotary Club of Abuja, Minister's Hills, we want to say a big thank you for giving us such a very revealing and inspiring presentation. And I and I can assure you that Rotary has taken the environment as one of its main areas of focus. And we thought you've uh, provided us tonight the information. I believe it's going to help us experience to really um, consider these issues and see how best we can help eliminate some of the challenges that we foresee happening in the future. So once again, we are grateful and we hope that anytime we call upon you, you avail yourself. And I think, I don't think it would be a bad idea for you joining Rotary. <laughs> Shall we? He's already a Rotarian by default. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I'll go through the process. But sure. but before I, I also say thank you quickly, I, I want to thank uh, especially my dad, who has been uh, my number one supporter. He's been online. Um, yeah, I guys. think the time system is not good. But he's been he's been uh, very powerful. I I believe that when it comes to Ghana, he's going to be a part of uh, the Meridian uh, community. And so thank you very much, um, Daddy. And I'm really grateful. And to all my sisters and to all my colleagues, I'm grateful. Baptista, Philip. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, our Daddy. We are happy to have you online. <laughs> thank you. And hi to everybody. Thank you, sir. So thankful for all you are doing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. We move to next on the agenda, which is um, attendance report for tonight. I would like to acknowledge the presence of the following president. We have tonight um, present. Gabriel, from the Rachel Club of Abuja, DC. I think you joined us. But today, tonight, I didn't hear you, President Gabriel. What happened? He's sitting in a conference. Oh, okay. he's in a conference. Yeah, he's in a conference in a, a Nigerian Bar Association conference in New York. So he just came into the fellowship. He's a, he's the president of the Rachel Club of Abuja, which is Central. Central. President Gabriel, it was great still having you, even though you were in the other conference. We also have Alpi Valley from the Rotary Club of Akaligon East. Alpi Valley, thank you for joining us tonight. We also had the uh, present. Okay, provisional. Alpi Valley, you want to say something? Okay. Um, Happy Valley wanted to have a word with us. We also had um, the president of the Provisional Club of of um, RC Son President, Provisional President Catherine. She, in fact, she did very well to join this meeting tonight with about 10 of her provisional members. So uh, we can acknowledge you and your members. Yeah, thank you very much, President. Thank you for hosting us. We're a very new club, but uh, we have just uh, launched our Mission Green uh, program as a club under the able leadership of uh, Betty Nandaula, who is online. We're very happy to be here. We're beginning to make friends, and thank you very much. We'll join you again. We will also share with you our flyer. Join us on Sundays, 3 to 4. It's late here, so it's almost midnight. So we will uh, just say thank you and good night from Uganda. Thank you, President. Thank you. Philip, Philip, I would just thank like you. to add. Philip, I would just president. like to add that she is becoming the president of with hundred chart over hundred charter members. Wow. 
122, 56 women and uh, 60, uh, 56 women and 66 men. Thank you, President. That, 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 is, that in itself is, is an achievement. Please, can you drop your contact? <laughs> can you drop your contact information so that in case we want to... Uh, I, I, I will share, I'll share with you, Gloria. Okay. Thank okay. you, Pastor Thank President. You. Thank you. Thank you, President. Thank you. Yeah, good night. Thank you, my Chatter President. And I also want to far spend. I may not be able to go to the whole. We had some various clubs in Ghana and also outside of Ghana. And I want to say that we are most grateful. In total, we had 48 join our people from over seven different countries joining tonight's meeting. So we are very grateful that you took time to join our meeting tonight. And next week, we're going to have a joint meeting with the Rotary Club of Accra, the East. And we want to again invite you to join us next week, Thursday, at the same time. And I also want to thank PPVJ for also the good work to publicize the Rotary Club of Human Meridian around the world. PPVJ, we are very grateful for your efforts. So our meeting has officially come to an end. If I let me also acknowledge Utilen Shida from Pakistan. In fact, she's been away for a long time. And I invited her tonight and she made time. So please, are you with us? Can we have a word? Okay. I think she may be off the line. So once again, we, we, we also have President Anguam Yuba from Rotary Club of Abuja Jabil inside. Oh, okay. Alpi, thank you for making time to be part of us. Greetings to members of your club. Greetings to members of your club. So I would like us to end our meeting by drinking a toast. In fact, to all Rotarians, to first Rotary International and to all Rotarians, wherever they may be. So shall we all take our glass well charged with some drinks and let's a toast to Rotary International, Rotarians, wherever they may be. Rotary International, Rotarians, to Rotarians wherever, wherever they may be. So, fellow Rotarians, our meeting has officially.